Good. Welcome everyone to So Grow Thrive webinar series uh, to empower farmers for financial success. My name is Hannah Blackley. I am the Extension Manager for the Southern South Island and I'm also very lucky to be farming sheep and beef down here with my husband Hamish and our three children. We're very privileged to be farming on our own. Um, we did went through farm succession about three years ago so financially it's pretty tough for us just starting out so I really get um, how it is for other farmers out there. Um, a couple of more good years under the belt would have been great for us to set us up really well going forward. So it's um, been hard for our farming partnership to keep our eyes up and looking forward. Last um, meet, week, Hamish and I met with our accountant and bank manager for our annual catch-ups. Um, I don't know how it ended up, but they were both in the same week. But was actually really encouraging to hear some of the great choices um, that we'd made on farm and that we needed to be proud of because I think when things get really tough it's really easy to forget about those um, things. Uh, my parents farmed through the 80s like many of you will have grown up on farms during the 80s and that tough times but mum um, talks about how grateful she is now to see us farming because we're just so much better about talking about things financially. She just said back in the 80s, everyone just, no one said a word. We all, they all got on with it, but nobody actually realised how hard it was financially for everybody. You just kind of went through it by yourselves. So um, we, we're so lucky that we're um, opening up, um, we're trusting each other. And we saw that with the panel last week about uh, the power behind being really vulnerable. Um, so it's my privilege tonight to host part two of the six-part webinar series on behalf of the Beef and Lamb Extension team. Um, it's been a great collaborative opportunity for our team and provides us with the opportunity to reach far and wide with support and encouragement for getting through. Across the six webinars, you'll hear from many wonderful farmers, accountants, bankers and experts providing you with insights and tools to grow and thrive. So it's time to sit back and enjoy from the kitchen table and the Lazy Boy Chairs uh, from Cape Ranger to the Bluff. Um, tonight's topic is Budgets and Beyond, Discovering Opportunities Through Cash Flow Monitoring. So our guest tonight, Fraser Weir, has a couple of farmers for, from Southland to thank for his appearance tonight. Both of these farmers are really highly regarded and they're doing some really outside the box thinking and pushing the boundaries. So I got really curious and asked them both about their trusted farming team. And they both said to me, uh, one of the keys to their success was that they've got, in their words, a bloody good accountant, uh, expensive, but so worth every cent. Cheap, uh, it's always but, cheap, Hannah. <laughs> but, you know, I look at our accountant bill and it's, you know, on par so I think it's uh, worth every cent as well and that's what they reiterated though that you're worth every cent so but coincidentally they both have the same accountant which is you Fraser so I just knew that you were the man for the job tonight so Fraser specializes in providing financial consultancy succession planning and accountancy services to clients predominantly in the ag sector throughout the South Island so Fraser began his career as a role manager for the Bank of New Zealand and he advises several corporate farming ventures with multiple shareholders and acts for individual shareholders investing in these companies. Fraser has clients throughout the North, Mid and South Canterbury regions and services accounts in Otago and Southland. Fraser has also been a shareholder in a dairy farm equity partnership in Southland. So tonight, Fraser will give a presentation. During this presentation, please pop questions in the chat um, that you think of, because that's how we get the real value out of these evenings. Don't hold back. Alternatively, um, you can text them to me anonymously. So my cell phone number is 027 0702, and I'll pop that in the chat. And we'll have time um, for questions at the end of Fraser's session as well. So welcome to tonight's webinar. Fraser, nice to have you on. Thanks, Hannah. And um, guys, just to endorse what Hannah was saying, I'm more than happy to answer any questions on the way through. So Hannah will monitor those. So if you do have any questions, um, just put them through in the chat and we'll go from there. So um, Olivia, do you want to go through to those slides I pulled together? 
so guys, instead of you just standing or listen, sitting there, sitting in your living rooms and um, listening to me talk on, I've just prepared five or six slides here. And my plan is to talk probably for the next 30 minutes to 35 minutes around the five or six key things I see that are really important for you to think about as we go through the next week period. Um, just a bit more of an introduction to myself, um, following up on what Hannah just said. So, yep, I'm a specialist farm accountant. Um, yes, I'm an accountant, but as I got in, in the slides there, often our role is changing these days. I probably spend more time as a, a coach, a facilitator, and a mentor. Um, the job that you guys do is hard, um, and, and the really rewarding part for the role for me is not so much the numbers, but it's helping farmers really grow the business. Um, bit more of my background, so I've been working in the sector for 25 years. First five years of that, as Hannah suggested, was um, working for a bank. Loved that, but saw some opportunities, so I went back to university and retrained, and for the last 20 years have been building myself a client base of all farming clients, so I deal with very little else apart from farmers, and most of that is farming family businesses throughout the South Island. Um, and it gives me a lot of pleasure doing that job, although, as you can see, I've lost them here in the process. Um, there's no doubt, guys, that we're coming off a peak. Um, and, and one thing, and I'm not sure if our government realises this, that the amount of tax take from the farming sector over the next 12 months is going to be pretty negligible to what it's been over the last two or three years. Um, but you've always got to get back to that big picture. As an industry, we're still in a really, really good place. We produce really good products, um, and our main markets are still growing in population and wealth. But we do have these um, cycles we go through, and not only for sheep and beef, but, but for dairy, we are really heading into another one of those cycles. Um, and, and so it's about just understanding what levers you have to pull to manage that. And so tonight, I'm going to talk about five key things that I think it's really important that you think about as you go through this process. And as I said, just please ask any questions and handle file them on the way through. So the first key lesson for me, um, in red at the top of that slide, um, in my view, working on your business is more important than working in it. Now, I know as an accountant sitting here in Christchurch, that's really easy to say, um, but it's really important for you and your partner that if you do get the chance that you um, get out of the weeds a wee bit. Um, it's tempting, especially when you've got tight cash flows to just put your, on, get on, put your head down and get on with it, um, but that's stepping back and, and looking at the picture and the big picture is really important. One of the best ways I've seen farming business do this is to develop a team approach. Um, and I've put in my slides there that lovely word governance. So this is a form of governance. It's a, a team approach. And, and the reason I see this work really well is it helps hold you to account as you make decisions. Um, when you're just working by yourselves and you're farming business, it's easy just to do those day-to-day -day stuff. And, Accounts have this problem as well. There's always things we don't like doing. Sometimes it's office work. Um, and having a team approach and some regular meetings with your key advisors can help hold you to account. Okay. Another real advantage is that um, it helps you develop a plan on the way through. Another really good thing I see about this teamwork approach is if you've got two or three people around a table, you'll discuss things from two or three perspectives. And I heard Hannah mention earlier that she had meetings last week with her accountant one day and her bank manager the next. Next year, when her and her husband do that, my suggestion to her would be that she combines both those meetings into one. Um, it'll save them one less, it'll make one less trip to town, but also sure, and her husband will get real value out of hearing the discussions they have between the accountant and the banker. And what that does is it facilitates a good decision making process because you've heard about the same issue from two or three perspectives and it'll help you make better decisions. Um, this team approach is becoming quite common. So if I look at my client base, I've probably got uh, 20 to 30 clients that I'm carrying out this sort of approach with now where we're meeting regularly through the year with a group of people. Okay? I've done some reflecting on this, and I think one of the reasons this is becoming much more common is because running farming businesses is becoming really complex. Um, there's an accountant in Christchurch who's been around for a long time that many of you would have heard of, Peter Alexander. When I started out accounting, he had a saying, which I think is still true, if you can afford to go farming, you can afford to retire. You have significant wealth tied up in your business. And over the last few years, a lot of farming businesses have grown significantly. You're not dealing with small numbers. And so 
the old days in my view of mum and dad, you and your partner discussing things casually around the kitchen table are becoming harder because you do have so many things you need to deal with. And this teaming approach so that you've got two or three people with slightly different lenses on the same issue can be a really good way to come up with some good discussions. Um, another area that this works really well is the um, when you've got a number of stakeholders involved. And probably what I'm referring to there is family businesses where you've got two or two or sometimes three generations. Having that team approach, and I know you, um, for those who were on the call last week, um, you were talking and had Justin Kidd speaking. Um, Justine does quite a bit of work in this area as well and one thing that she says is that this works very well but for farming family businesses you need someone independent of those discussions because you are wearing so many hats and having someone independent will help you um, think in the right hat in terms of focusing on the business and maybe not as mum and dad. Third point in this area is if you think about that team structure the, um, the structure of the team is quite important. Okay? And two key things you need to think about is the skill sets that you need and diversity. Now, when I'm talking about diversity, I'm not talking about um, skin color or, um, or gender. I'm talking about diversity of thought. So one of the worst things you can do if you put a team around you is have too many of the same people. So for example, three accountants on a board normally look at numbers and often don't get things done. Okay. Likewise, if you have three quite entrepreneurial people, Sometimes decisions run away and the detail won't get dealt with. So the important thing is to have a balance and have different personality types and diversity. And what you'll get is you get much richer discussion and you'll look at things properly. One thing not to do is just to have um, a mate from down the road or people get on with. Discussions seem really, really nice, but sometimes you don't get the action that you need out of them. Um, two other key points on that. Um, Having a chairman and facilitator is really important with their key role, making sure that the discussion sticks to the big picture stuff and doesn't get down into the weeds too much. Otherwise, you spend three hours talking about sheep breeds and, um, and, and feed cultivators where this, these things should be more about the big picture. Where do you want to be in, in two years' time? What are the key things you need to, do, be, to get there? What are the risks in your business? And the final job for that chair is just to have a very short list of action points. These are the key things that came out of the meeting that you need to action board next meeting. So for those of you that um, aren't following a process like this, it's, it's really well worth thinking about. And I reflect on two of my groups that are doing this. Um, interestingly, one from Southland that started this 15 years ago when the sun came home. Um, that process has continued all the way through, but it's evolved. Um, I've been on that board a couple of times and offered a couple of times. The meetings have gone from two a year when things were just steady state um, to when they bought a new farm, we met four times a year. So there's no real fixed structure to this. You need to design it to what works for your business. I've got another family in North Canterbury who have been working for the last three years. Um, they're very good at doing their own budgets. So I meet with them twice a year. Um, meet with them last week to look at last year and how it went and sign off the budget for this year, and we'll catch up again in February. Interestingly, um, they're good at their own budgets, but they have to get off site. So they came into my office, spent two days in their office. I didn't see them, but it was just to get them off the, off the farm, away from the detail, so they could look at that big picture of the plan for the next 12 months, two years. So sometimes that's their method of um, getting out of the weeds. They get off farm through some of that stuff. So I'm um, like, guys, Hannah, if there's any questions come through about that anymore, or if you've got any questions at the end, just ask me. So first key platform, working on your business and more important than working in it and getting that teamwork right. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Olivia. So Fraser, I'm just going to pipe in there. I just wondered um, when you talk about um, the farming team that comes into your office in Christchurch and they're keeping out of the weeds, they're looking high level, what yep. sort of things are they focusing on? What's, what's the conversation? Um, obviously, there's um, always a session on finances. Okay? How's the business performing year to date against variance? Okay? There's always variances. That's just a fact of life. But what's caused those variances? Um, is it management? Um, if it's a bigger business and they've got um, farm managers, is that manager actually performing? If he's not performing, what do we need to do to help them to get him performing? What are his weaknesses? Um, 
Health and safety becomes a big one on the way through often, Hannah. Um, are your systems up to scratch? How are you actually using them? And what is that plan for the next four to five years? So things that are um, often quite hard to discuss around the kitchen table, but trying to keep that bigger picture and linking that back to what's happening on the farm now. Do they talk about goals as part of that journey? And that's the planning I'm talking about. That's the four to five year plan. And yeah, but, nice. but but Hannah, that's not saying goals aren't something you can just come up with in five minutes. And I've got one, although it is a dairy farming business, um, it took them about three or four years to get their goals right. Okay. And with the advisory board gently pushing back and saying, Are you sure that's right? And they go have another look at it and come back. And then they'd go and look at a project that was just outside their goals completely. Well, how does that project align when you told us at the last meeting these were your goals? They go, oh, that's a good point. They go and think about it again. So, so don't expect you can go and write your goals down in five minutes. If you're true to them, it actually takes quite a while. Yeah, and, they evolve, and they evolve. So if I continue on and, and being an accountant, next banker, you'd be, you wouldn't be surprised at this one. But um, for me, understanding your business finances is really, really important. And in that, the key is at the moment, especially when we're going into harder financial times, cash is king. Okay? This is not about production. Um, it's not about investing in the future. It's about maximizing your cash position on the way through, but walking that knife edge of not cutting things too much, which affect future production. Okay? And not future production, sorry, future profitability. And we probably saw that, if I give you an insight from the dairy sector, in the last time we had a low payout in the 215s, some dairy farmers got really heavy-handed with how they cut some of their expenses to improve that cash position. But they went over that knife edge and they felt the impacts of that for a couple of years later, especially in breeding and out breeding animal health. So it's just getting that, that touch point of managing cash position, but ma ma making sure you maximize it. Um, to do that, um, I think it's really important that you go through that process of doing a budget. Now, for me, and for you want to, if you want to use that for your bankers, doing that in paper or using a computer program is the best. But I do have a number of farmers that still run their budgets in the head, and you ask them any question, they know it, okay? because I've been running their system for so long. While that approach works for them, it's really hard to communicate those numbers to other stakeholders in the group. And so that's why for me, using a computer program to do those budgets, lock them down and regularly review them. And Hannah and I were talking about this before we um, came on the call. Um, what I see works really well in this area is if you're doing your GST returns every two months, okay, you've just done your GST return, you can look at the actuals for the last two months versus the budget, where the variances, and update it, the budget for the next, for the rest of the year. So when you look at that closing bank balance, you know, okay, are we now going ahead of budget? Are we improving the closing bank balance? Or is it going backwards? If it's going backwards, why? And what can I do about that? And the two main programs that we have in New Zealand that most of our clients use, which are either farm focus or zero and figured, are really, really good. And one of the key benefits we've got with both of those now is that they're web-based. And so the key with that is that then if you've got any questions, and we have this regularly now where... Um, we'll get phone calls from clients. Hey, we've just updated the budget. Can you have a look at it for me? You can do that same with the bank. You can do it with your farm consultant. So with those programs now being web-based, it makes that process of collaborating around those things so much easier. A couple of other really important observations here from my perspective. Um, when we're going through these periods where cash is tight, okay, we've all experienced inflation and, and inflation in the farming sector has been rampant over the last couple of years. Um, stick to, to what you do and do it well, but be really careful around um, significant changes unless you're certain of the outcome. Okay? So if you're good at what you're doing, be very, very careful. I had an example a couple of years ago with, with a deer farmer who decided to improve his profitability. He went on, went on an embryo transplant program. It could quite a bit of cost, but it didn't actually work that well for his business. He would have been better in hindsight just focusing on um, his venison and velvet production. So it's very tempting sometimes to go down and look at um, what sounds like great, great opportunities to, to increase income, but um, often they can result in actually the opposite um, because you can take the, ball, the eye off the ball for the rest of the business. And 
this is another question I'm often asked is, right, Fraser, can you please look at our costs and what are the two, one or two big areas that we can save in our costs? My key message here, guys, is that there is very, very rarely one or two key areas that you can reduce costs. Okay? It's about a focus right through the whole business. It's about finding um, $21,000 savings is always much easier than saving one amount of $20,000. So it's just having an efficiency focus right through the whole business. And guys, this is not only within the farming costs, it's also your personal costs. Okay? So stand back and look at what drawings you've got, what you had planned, and, and look at the total business cost as well. Um, you might have your farm working costs under control, but if you're going to replace a vehicle during the year, you can blow that budget really, really quickly. And and final thing on this stuff is, if numbers and finances aren't your strength, get help. Um, because there's plenty of people out there that can help you. And, and go back to that team approach, it's about identifying what your strengths are and getting people to help you. And if numbers aren't your strength, then get a good accountant. Um, get a farm consultant to help you with that stuff on the way through. Yeah, nice points there. We've got a uh, question in the chat there. It says, Fraser, cash is king, but how do you identify where cutting costs impact on future performance? Are there red flags to watch for? Which is actually um, a question I was going to ask you as well, because it is that really key point there around where do you save? So I'll go back to the point I made, Hannah. It's making lots of small savings. If you're going in and saying, we're going to cut our third bull by a third and reduce it from, and just for argument's sake, from 100,000 down to 60,000. Okay? That seems really good and it'll save you cash that year. But if your accountant's telling you that your third use per stock unit has been below average for the last few years and your Olsen P's are really low already, that's a real warning flag. So for me, it's about lots of small savings. It's just having that efficiency sign and, and telling your staff to do the same thing so they're careful with vehicles, so they're not um, wrecking things and causing repairs and maintenance. But if you're looking at a big saving and thinking that we can reduce, and this is what the dairy farm, some dairy farmers did in 2015, they went into breeding and cut it by half. And that's exactly what happened. It impacted on production and profitability in future years. But if you can find 50 lots of $1,000 throughout your business, there's 50 grand, it won't have the same impact. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Those margins, those one or two percent margins. Patrick Crawshaw talked about that last week on the panel around um, just that taking that one or two percent here and there, but across your whole board, that really starts to add up. So, Fraser, just um, a further question: What? So, looking at your top performing clients, what are they doing at the moment now in terms of um, cash flow? What decisions are they making? Um, so the first thing they're doing, Hannah, is and, and they're not only doing budgets for this 12-month period, they're doing budgets for next year as well. Okay? And the reason that it's important is that the cash flow pain out of the reduced profit at the moment isn't going to hit for the typical sheep and beef farmer until December next year. Okay? Because if you actually have unfortunate cash loss this year, it's when your overdraft peaks that you actually really feel the impact of that. And for most sheep and beef farms, that's in November, December, before most of the income starts coming through from lamb sales. So those really good operators are actually forecasting out not just the next 12 months until the, until June 2023, 2024, they're going through until June 2025. So they understand those longer term impacts, not only on this year, but next year as well. And then as we talk about later on, and then they're having proactive discussions with the bank now about what they need. And the banks are giving them the facilities they need so they can um, have comfort that they've got a business that's viable that can take them through. So they're not just thinking about the implications now, they're thinking about the long-term implications. Yeah, but they're, I not, like but, that. They're, and, but they're not but they're not making wholesale changes. They're making sure that every blade of grass on the farm is being eaten and conserved. Um, they're being really careful with vehicles so that they don't have big R and M bills um, and, and just being really careful, but making sure they stick their knitting and do it really, really well. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? And an interesting point there you make about overdrafts as well. That's one of the conversations we had with the bank 
um, last week because we always hit that peak overdraft exactly at that time of year. You've got to pay for your winter crops, but you don't have any lambs going to the works yet. Um, and yeah, so um, the last couple of years we've had to extend our limit and we're looking at doing that this year as well. So planning for that. So what advice do you have um, for farmers out there that do have those cash flow pinches? You know, what what's good practice? What does that look like? Well, it's, it's just exactly that. It's it's the planning for it going forward, okay? And having early discussions with the bank about it in terms of this is the picture for the next 18 months. Also thinking about what's happening to your stock levels, okay? For those guys that are growing a bit of crop, what actually is happening to our crop and feed on hand because sometimes your cash position is de deteriorating because you're holding extra stock. So it's understanding those underlying levers as well. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Fraser. So if we probably move on to my third um, third key area, and this is um, another one that farmers don't like very much, okay? but it is important, and that's risk management. Okay? Now, one important thing here, guys, there's no template for risk management. You can't talk to your neighbour and say, well, that's his risk management program, so I'm, mine's going to be the same. And the key reason for that is because everyone's risk profile is quite different. And it's a question I ask a lot of my clients, especially when we're looking at things like fixed interest rates. I'll get my clients to answer a question on a scale of one to 10, what's your, how risk adverse are you? One being you're very risk adverse. Number 10, you actually, risk doesn't keep you awake at night. And just getting a simple gut reaction for that of one to 10, because that starts to give you an understanding of where your risk profile is, because if you are very conservative from a risk perspective, there are ways that you can manage it. Okay? So you can look at things like what we want to lock in um, our feed contracts. We want to use fixed interest rates to take those risks out of your business. I mean, or what options are there is to go to the meat companies and have fixed contracts for our stock sales. So there's tools out there that you can use, but if you're actually risk adverse, i.e. your scales at 10, um, you need to think about whether you should be using those tools. Maybe that you, those things don't keep you awake at night. This whole area of risk is um, it's an interesting one, and, and I find clients really challenged by it because they think it's going to be a really long process. And I've just, in my slides here, got a really simple tool which I see people use, and it's called a risk matrix. And so you can do this in 10 minutes, okay? because people quite often go through and list their risks and then they say, well, what do we do with these? How do we know which is the most important? So what I encourage people to do is to have a wee table. And if you think about this just in, in your head and you imagine an Excel spreadsheet and the first column of that table, you go and list all your risks. And I've got one that a client did for me recently. Okay, and one of their risks was sheep schedule movement. Another one was interest rates. Another one was performance of the farm manager. Another one was climate. Another one was health and safety. So they had a list like that of about 15 different things. What I got them then to do was to go through for each of those risks and give each of the following headings a score out of five. The first is, what is the likelihood of that risk? Okay. What's the likelihood of interest rates going up between one, it's never going to happen, five it is. Okay. Second one being, what is the impact that has on your business? You have a whole lot of debt, if interest rates go up, then it has a high impact. And then the final one being, the what's your ability to control or influence that? And so you once again score that out of five. So once you've gone through all your risks and given them a number, you run a very simple formula over them for those that can see the slides where you times the likelihood by the impact and divide it by the controllability. And what that gives you is an overall number. So all of a sudden you've got a rank for each of those risks. And the ones with the highest ranking are the ones that potentially are the biggest risk to your business. And then it's a case of standing back and saying, right, that's identified for me that while I thought it was interest rates was the biggest risk to my business, because I can actually control the interest rates through fixed rates, actually management's the biggest risk because of my farm manager. What do I do about that? And it'll give you a list of them. And so then you can start focusing on what are the most important risks. Because as I said before, quite often people do that process and things that they thought were important actually are further down the list. And it gives a way of just ranking them from top to bottom. So it's just a simple way that you can do in half an hour. Don't be scared by it. Um, use it like a brainstorm, but it doesn't have to be a five or six hour thing 
or, or pages and pages of notes. Hopefully that's just a good simple tool you can use to rank your risks in your business. So yeah, I like, yeah, I like that phrase. It's a nice, um, simple model that we can all use on our farms. And I think risk is something that we probably, we know in the back of our minds and we say interest rates, but we don't actually do enough. Um, I know here on farm conversations around how we're going to manage our risks. So with some of those bigger risks that we've got in front of us at the moment, what um, mechanisms are you seeing some of your clients put in place to manage that risk portfolio? Well, it depends on what that risk is, um, Hannah. Okay. Uh, for some businesses we've done this, actually we've identified that health and safety is one of the bigger risks. And um, although they've got all the... Um, all the brochures and stuff, and they've got all the templates, how are they actually managing that with the staff? And so it's about actually turning their health and safety processes into a culture, not just a, um, a process of looking at the, the forms and those sorts of things. So it's it's different for each one, but it allows you to stand back and then really question, actually, is that a risk and how do you deal with it? Yeah, nice. Um, we've got a question in the chat too, Fraser, which is Good. exciting. It says, which way around does the controllable scale go from one to five? So controllable is um, one, you have no control over it, and five, you have lots of control over it. So if you think about that in the context of interest rates, if the likelihood was high at five and the impact was five, high at five, five times five is 25, okay, if your view was you can you can control it really easily, you can control it, okay, then your ability to influence it is five. So 25 divided by five gives it a very low rating. Okay. Thank you. So Olivia, if you want to go on to that next slide, please. So fourth care for me and Hannah, you've already asked me some really good questions around this, but it's it's managing that banking relationship in your finances. So um, really important here, guys, that you're, you give the bank accurate information and timely information. And when I talk about that, it's budgets at the beginning of the year. Things are very variable at the moment. Um, where most of you did your budget back in June and July, your schedule is probably going to be quite different to now. Update those and send them through the bank. Um, it's really important to manage that relationship. And I mean, I've had meetings with all the big banks lately, and they're all very, very supportive of the sector. They understand what's going on. Um, and for those that are being proactive and, and going and seeing them, um, I'm seeing all the banks looking at cash flows and saying, hey, um, no, there is no way when we look at your cash flow, we can see you're doing the best you can. Um, you can't afford to pay principal next 12 months. So let's take the principal payments out of your budget. Because there's no point the banks recognize this of paying principal if you're um, not making a cash surplus because all you're doing is converting taking it from term debt and pushing to overdraft and pushing your overdraft rates up. So I'm seeing the banks being very, very supportive around that. The key to it though is when you put your numbers in front of the bank, be conservative and then make sure you hit them. And, and, and one of the things the bank really like to see and we talk about those re-forecasts is the variance reports. And so, and I touched on this earlier, when you do your GST every two months, um, in farm focus or in figured, have a look at your variance reports and look at your key areas of expenses animal health for, for the first two months of the year, why wasn't that animal health two, $2,000 ahead of budget? And, and if there are any major ones, tell your bank what they are and where, why they were. And you'll be, you'll be surprised at the response you get because they're looking for people to be really proactive managing the stuff. And, and I touched on this earlier, if finances aren't your strength, then get help. And I mean, if it's actually, you don't want to do the GST returns and all the bill payment, find someone to do it for you. Um, there's plenty of farm administrators. Because of technology, we now actually pay the bills for about probably 10 to 15 of our clients. They don't have the time to do it. There's no one with the skill set in the business to do it. And with some of the technology, you can actually really easily do that remotely. Okay. Then obviously accountants can help with this. Farm consultants have often have, especially the whole of farm system consultants, have really good skills for helping with cash flows and budgets. And then there's farm finance specialists out there which can help with this stuff as well. So if it's not a skill set and you want someone to help manage the bank relationship with you, then find someone that can do that. Um, because it's really important to communicate with the bank, especially bad news. Tell them early. Okay? 
they prepared, and going back to what you were talking about before, Hannah, they'd, pre they'd prefer to know six months in advance that you're going to need an overdraft extension, not two days before you've got the bills to pay. Um, one final thing on, on managing banking relationships and finances is sitting down and thinking about what your policy is in terms of interest rates. And this goes back to risk the risk, risk management a wee bit. It's really good to just think about interest rates and what your policy is around fixing interest rates. Okay? If, you're very, um, if you've got a high risk tolerance, you might be quite happy with floating rates. And I've got a lot of people that have got a lot of floating debt at the moment. But if you have a highly debted business, then you might decide that you always want to have 50% of your debt fixed on an average three-year term. And if you've got a sort of a, and that's what you call a policy in the back of your head, when you then go and look at refixing debt, you use that policy to make the decision. Instead of that rate looks really good and you go and lock in for five years at the moment because it's lower than the build rate, that mightn't seem so good in a couple of years' time if rates change. But if you've got that policy, it just helps as a framework to make decisions. Yeah, that's a really good point. I like that about having an interest rate policy. I remember probably 18 months ago or longer, Hamish and I were spending half a day sitting around um, the kitchen table debating and calculating whether to lock in rates or not. And they were sort of rates um, starting with threes and fours and the irony of it now in thinking about, oh, if we're only locking for this much, it's going to save us this much. Um, yeah, and just having the confidence to make those decisions around locking in rates. So how do you go about, um, I guess my question for you, Fraser, is how do you go about developing that policy and then backing yourselves to actually stick to it? Well, you're never going to get it right, Hannah. Okay. <laughs> you're not. But it goes back to the, your risk profile. Okay. So if you've got a situation at the moment where you want low risk, one of the ways that you can de-risk the business is by taking fixed interest rates. And if I look in the last five years, my clients that decide, no, we've got a pretty high tolerance to risk, they were all on floating. And they did really, really well out of that um, over the last two or three years. They had interest rates down in 2 and 3%. But they're paying for it now. For those that said, no, we want to have 50% of our debt fixed all the time, and have just continued rolling stuff through, yes, they paid 2 or 3% higher in the past, but now they'll be 2% lower. So they're just getting the rules all on the way through. They've got more certainty and they've got a lag to affect their business. But if you think you're going to game these things and make money out of it, you never do. It's about risk profile and if it helps you sleep at night because you know that your cash flow is not going to be really effective when it's going up, then have a policy like that. Yeah, that's really good advice. I think and, for us... And, and yeah. then come back and review it every every year. Is that still relevant? I oh, actually know we had a really good year last year. We sold a bit of land off. Our debt level was much lower. We're now quite comfortable with floating rates because our whole situation's changed. That's you right. Review all, them. Mm, that's really good advice. And, you know, Hamish and I, we've ended up splitting ours a bit. So I think we've got four different rates. And so we're spreading our risk portfolio too. So we've got fixed coming off at different times um and these yeah, policies, they come it, off it's a bit of a shock and if you go back to my team approach hannah this sort of things what's your interest rate policy um that's what you discuss at your team meetings or for for, for those in dairy for, for for those in the group that um, have got dairy farms the this discussion is all about milk futures now and should they fix the milk futures next 12 months and what's their policy about when and where they do that and we'll see more of those products, in my view, come into the sheep and beef that's set to go forward. That's an opportunity, isn't it? Fraser, I'm just wondering about rates. Um, there's been discussion, um, I know with our action group, we talk about rates. Um, everything's out on the table with our action group. We're pretty transparent about our businesses. But yes. there's a lot of rate variance between uh, different farms. So I'm just wondering, you know, what's your advice to farmers around... Um, you know, can we go and ask a bank for a better rate? Or how do we, um, in, you know, show that we're uh, really efficient in what we do and deserve a better rate? Is that even a thing? Yes, it is. And and the way I um, the way I deal with that is I have real, a really open discussion with the bank of, hey, um, ask the bank, what is your current customer rating? What are the key things that are driving it? And what can you do to improve that? And 
the two key things or the two the three key things that drive the customer rating with the banks are your personal factor, how good do they see you as running your business, B, your cash flow, and then finally your security value. And you hear the banks quite often talk about the LVR or, to, or the loan to value ratio. And so sometimes if you can get your farm revalued and that value goes up, it'll push you into another um, risk rating with the bank and um, you can get an straight reduction. So I have quite open discussions with the banks. Hey, where are we sitting at the moment and what are our levers to pull? And if we can reduce our debt by this much, does this get us into another risk rating? Because if you can improve that customer rating, and Hannah, this works both ways, if you go well, you can get 20, 30, 40, 50 point reductions in interest rates, but it goes the other way as well. If you have a number of bad years and the bank's not comfortable with how things are performing, the interest rates will go back up. So it's really hard to compare rates around the table between things like a farm discussion group because of some of those things of all clients will have a slightly different risk rating in their business. Yeah, that's right. But just have an open discussion with them. Hey, where is our risk rating and what are the levers we've got to pull to do it? And they'll say, look, if you can reduce your debt by half a million dollars, it'll get you into another risk rating and this is what happened to your interest rates. And then you can make a decision, well, are we better to put that cash into debt reduction or to buy another farm or replace some vehicles? Yeah, interesting. We've got a couple of questions have popped into the chat, which is great to see. So the first one is, Fraser, there's another advantage with a clear interest policy helps set that cost for you and your budget so you can move on to look at other areas in your business to control spending. Correct. Yep, I agree. So that's the advantage of having a clear policy and having a fair chunk of your interest on um, on fixed interest rates as you don't have that uncertainty around interest rates changing. Okay. So definitely agree yeah. completely. Yeah, nice. Um, the second one is, what are your thoughts on using bank advisors, e.g. NZAB, for dealing with banks? Um, in the right situation, they're a good tool. Okay. If dealing with banks are not your thing and you don't have other advisors around you with the skill set to do them, then groups like NZAB can do a really, really good job. But you've got to stand back and say, are they the right thing for where we are in our business? Yeah, interesting. Um, Fraser, I've just got one other quick question around banks. When they turn up at the farm to have your catch up, what are the basic must-haves? Like, what are the must-dos that you need to be doing with your bank to impress them? Comes down to what level of debt you've got, Hannah. Um, for me, but and this is not to think, this is just for your business. It's to have a cash flow forecast for the year and, more importantly, a revised cash flow forecast. I probably do still see too many clients that will do the budget at the beginning of the year. And so if the bank turns up in August, that's still really relevant. But if you're in December when they're coming out, not just having a, a, a forecast which has got the actuals for the first six months and the original budget for the last six, I think going to that next step and saying, hey, actually the schedule's gone up or down and changing the last few lamb sales so you've got a true forecast of what the actual year end of year result's going to be. Because then you can have an awesome, just honest discussion with the bank about, well, how much debt can we repay during the year or what's the best opportunity with that cash? Is it debt repayment or investing this year over here? So it's, so it's having up-to-date information from when they turn up. And if there have been variances on the way through, hey, yes, our fertiliser bill is 30 grand over budget. That's because um, costs went up. Or the FERT rep said that if we lifted the Olsen piece in this block from 20 to 30, um, this would be the return. So we did it. But yeah, those, having that. yeah but just having that, being able to give them proactive information and, and then they can look at those and say, right, based on that, that's a true budget. We know what overdraft facilities Hannah and her husband need for the next 12 months. Because remember, all the banks these days also often have facility fees now in place for having your overdraft. And if you've got an accurate cash flow and they can reduce your limit by $100,000, that'll reduce some of those um, facilities fees for you. Yeah, having that full transparency, isn't it? No surprises. Yep. Great. So one final slide here for me, and, and Hannah, it was the question that you asked me at the outset of this, and I stood back and said, what are the key things from my top clients? What are, the, what are my top clients doing at the moment? And, and really, this is a summary of the stuff we've talked about for the last half an hour. Firstly, 
those good operators have a good team around them and they communicate well. Um, they have a plan, they carry it, and then they review it. So if they have a plan, they get things there and say, well, yeah, we had the plan on doing this. Did that work well or not? Um, no, we didn't put enough fertiliser on. We didn't sell those stock at the right time and then change their plan for the following year as a result of that. So they're always reviewing the decisions they made. Um, they understand the areas that they can control and focus on those. Um, and another one which I think is important is they don't tend to chase markets. They do what they're good at and have a system that suits a farm. And, and when I look at my really top operators, they tend to have a farming system that suits the natural attributes of the farm. They therefore get really good production at low cost structure. If you try to force a farming system onto a farm that doesn't actually suit it, if you're a good operator, you can get the same level of production, but sometimes the cost will be higher because you're having to bring more feed in, more food. It's about, for me, instead of chasing markets, it's about what system suits that farm. Um, and another really important one is keeping your farming system simple. Um, one of my South and clients, the one I referred to at the beginning, um, who have had a, an advisor board around 15 years, he has a knack of starting with a simple system and making it complicated. And twice now, we have stopped and said, no, hang on, let's go back and go back to the basics. And we've actually taken some of that complexity out. And then he started again. Because, but, but the top operators do tend to have simple systems, but they just do it really, really well. And, and the final one here is um, the top operators make early decisions. But you're coming up to a drought, they tend to be the ones that make the early decisions to sell their, um, their trading stock early. Um, and they make those decisions early. The worst thing you can do is not make the decision and hold on and on and on. And then you end up making a forced decision at the wrong time at the end. And, and the final one for me that's really, really important um, is this, this whole concept of balance. My good operators get that balance between family and time off they work on the business and balance that with working in it. And I know the ones I've got to be worried about because the ones that stop calling me because they've gone back to working in the business all the time and we've got to drag them back out of the weeds to get that balance of family time along with working on the business. Those last two are probably the most important for me in terms of what those good operators do. But um, that's enough from me, Hannah. Um, that's, that's everything. But my, my key messages there are obviously risk management, understand your banking, um, work on your business, not in it, and understand your cash flows run really well. Yeah, thanks, Fraser. That's really a really interesting point you made there around the decision making. I, um, you know, we're going into what's predicted for most the majority of the country to be a dry period, and um, I sort of remember a time um, not long after Hamish and I had taken over the farm, leasing it probably five or six years ago, and. Uh, we'd really got ourselves in the um, <laughs> in a not great space in the feed position and we sort of got a farm consultant in to help us and we sort of sat the, around the table and made probably six or eight really big decisions that day and um, afterwards like we never looked back at those decisions we never regretted them we just made them and moved forward um, but he did say to us at the time, you know, this isn't what we should be doing. Every week it doesn't rain. You guys should have made a decision. Yep. So I think, um, yeah, just some advice, I think, for everyone on the call tonight around that that critical piece of decision-making. How key is it? Yeah, it's, it's critical. And that's some, they, if I look at the top operators, they tend to have a process of making decisions early. And yes, sometimes they get it wrong. They sell their trading stocks. They think it's going to go dry and it rains the next week. Yeah, that's what happens sometimes, but then they'll find something else to eat that grass and they'll be in just as good a position. But they tend to make those decisions early because they know the system well and they know what their levers are when they've got those things coming up because they've looked at, and they don't, haven't always looked at their risk matrix. Some just have that innate ability to know what levers they can pull to get through things. It's always interesting yeah. trying to extract those things out of those, especially some of those older guys that have been running farms. They know all the stuff in the head. They just don't write it down. Yeah, interesting. What sort of decisions are some of your clients making now that you're seeing that are really positive? Um, they're just planning long term um, and just watching the pennies and pounds. Um, I'm not seeing anyone making any rash decisions. They're just keeping farming systems simple and minimising costs right across their business 
because the long long term outlook is still good. We've just got to continue managing these challenges we have at the moment. Yeah, interesting. We've got a few more questions in the chat, so we'll go through them. Uh, the first one is bank sustainability loans, pros and cons, any hooks to watch for? Um, no, I think they're a really good product that's in, in all the banks. We've got different variances out there, especially um, this stuff's just going to become norm. So while the banks are offering um, interest, rate, interest rate margin reductions on this stuff at the moment, my view is that in between five and 10 years, you just won't get a loan unless you're doing this stuff. Um, and so um, with some of the products that are out there, if you're already using things like FEP Plus and those things, actually you're actually doing a whole lot of the stuff that's needed already. Um, and um, one of the banks has got one which will give you an interest rate reduction right across all your debt. Others are specific loans. So for me, um, I think it's a good thing to use at the moment. Um, and get some benefits while it's there because this stuff is just going to be norm in five to 10 years' time. Yeah, I agree. Um, the next question is, is going interest only like to likely to increase your risk rating? Um, going interest only for the next one to two years is unlikely to increase your risk rating significantly. That's the key message I'm getting from the banks when I've asked that exact question. Okay. If, however, you go interest only and then you make some um, poor decisions or some unplanned decisions which cause a significant cash loss, if you have those cash losses for two or three years, that's when they'll start impeding on your um, on your risk rating. But if you have a, if you've got the farm running as well as you can and it's due to price and things outside your control, no, it's very unlikely. It's when the, it's when you get the cumulative effect of two or three years of losses coming through that it really starts to impact on those credit ratings within the banks. Okay, interesting feedback. Uh, the next question is, often it looks like on the face of it that reducing capital stock and having trading where only you buy and invest in a trade that generates a cash return, but you have said keeping systems are simple and knowing, and knowing to you may be more important. And uh, knowing to you, sorry. For, for me, keeping systems simple is really important. Um, then it's about saying what system suits your farming and understanding the capital costs. So, for example, um, should you be running sheep and beef or dairy grazers? Okay. Great advantage of running dairy grazers is you can sell that capital stock. Okay. So you can then redeploy that capital in other places. It might be to buy another farm. But you've got to understand that that cash flow coming through from the sale of that capital stock is not income, but it is capital. So if you go and use it um, on an overseas trip, is that the best use of that capital on the way through? If you move from capital stock to stock trading, um, and there are various companies out there with facilities to fund stock, the key question to ask is, what's the underlying finance rate they're charging you for providing you those stock? Okay. Because they will be able to quote that to you, and sometimes you'll be surprised about what those finance rates they are. So yes, they will say that they'll provide the stock, you grow them and sell them, and you'll get this at the end on the way through, but what is their underlying finance rate? So you can compare the cost of financing through those facilities to the bank, or to using your own capital. So it's just asking open questions, and, and understanding the relative cost between those different ways of providing stock onto your farm, which is either grazing, another party providing the finance, or you funding it yourself. Yeah, interesting. Uh, the next question, Fraser, is what are some of the computer programs for budgets that you can recommend? I could almost talk to this one too. So, so the, two, um, the two best programs that are most commonly used in New Zealand are Farm Focus, and, and Farm Focus is the old cash manager, which has been around for a long time, run and set up by Brian Eccles, and then Zero and Figured. And both are as good as each other on the way through. It's about what suits you. If you want something that's um, that's focused on cash management and those sorts of things, um, farm focus is very good. With zero and figure, you've got to use two programs, but you can then actually do financial statements. And, and um, you'll see a lot of accountants using zero. And, and what it means actually is that when our clients use it, then actually we're preparing our financial statements from the same program. But they are both as good as each other. The key is that you use one of them. They're both web-based. Accounts can look at them with you. You can um, So it's about what is your accountant um, using, suggest you use, what is your farm consultant like, 
if you're using a farm consultant, but you can't go wrong with either of those two from a farming perspective in New Zealand. Yeah, I agree. And the simplicity of using them as well. We use farm focus on farm and yep. it's just gold for us. I think, um, you know, and you don't have to like, I don't want people to feel like you have to be an expert. I knew absolutely nothing when I inherited the farm books and they were in the state of, um, they were still being done. The GST was still being calculated in an exercise book. So we took it all digital and um, I felt pretty confident within, you know, six to 12 months of what we were doing. And and it just does it all for you. And you just have um, so much more control. And, you know, I can't encourage people enough to, you know, as well as doing your GST and your coding, but to also um, utilize the stock reconciliation yeah. um, software on it as well, because um, I know it's always a good uh, heated discussion at the end of the year and uh, at our place, uh, adding out stock numbers and being a wee bit creative, but um, definitely being able to monitor that as well in entering that data when you're doing the sales and purchases is really important. I mean, Hannah, the thing from what we find is that there are farm administrators and accountants can do your GST and pay all your bills for you. And if that's not you, get them to do it. But we have a policy of if we can, we encourage our clients to do that stuff themselves because they understand their business so much better when they pay all the bills and look at each number on the way through. And because you're the web base now, for ones that are just starting out, they'll just say, hey, Fraser, can you go and have a quick look? In half an hour, we can check all the coding. And we find six months later, we don't have to check everything, anything because they're getting it all right. And that's the <laughs> beauty of these, of these That's the beauty of these web-based programs. Anyone can check it from anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm for, I think I told you before we started the webinar tonight that uh, my greatest achievement this year has been getting fired from doing the farm accounts because I forgot to pay the GST. I'd filed it and then <laughs> forgot that it wasn't direct um, debit anymore. So, um, But honestly, um, that's been the best thing for our farming business. Um, I've been really busy with off-farm work and so Hamish has stepped in and taken over doing the books and for him having that real understanding of what's going on financially as well as making the on-farm decisions I'm still there supporting him and sharing the budgets with him and things but um you know he's got he's in the driver's seat and that's just so good for him and he's actually doing 10 times a better job than I was and that's and because he, that's because he's seeing the linkage between the decisions he's making on farm and how that's impacting the bank account and so it's giving a much better connection between those decisions where if an accountant's doing that in the office it's really hard to get that connection yeah, and having that real valuable control and the variance reports and yep. all of those really important yeah, decisions. Um, There's a couple more questions and then we'll finish off. So what are your thoughts on higher purchase? Um, do the work yourself, staff member or power contractor? So is that one question, is it? it looks like two questions. What are your thoughts on higher purchase would be the first one or... So, um, so with, with, with high purchase, it's for me being an accountant, and I go back to that question I asked earlier. When you do a high purchase, ask what the finance rate is. Okay. Because the finance rate is telling you what the cost of funding is. And then you can go to your bank and say, well, if you fund it through your term loan or overdraft, how is that compared to the finance rate? Now, if you look at the machinery dealers at the moment, you'll notice as you drive past most machinery yards, there's a lot of gear sitting in yards. And so what they've started doing is they're actually providing some very, very good high purchase deals where you can go to one of the major tractor companies now and fund gear at quite low interest rates, much below the term debt rates. In that case, in my view, high purchase is great because the funding cost is less than the bank cost. Jump into it. If you don't have access to bank funding and high purchase is a bit more expensive, but it lets you buy that piece of kit, go for it. Um, the one thing you have to be careful between is high purchase and leases. With a high purchase, you um, own the gear and then you pay the high purchase off and you and then you have the bit of gear at the end. And if you look after it, you can run it for 10 years. Compared to leases, often at the end of a three-year lease, you give the piece of kit back and get a new piece of kit. Okay, And so you've got to decide whether you want to continue trading that piece of gear every three years on the way through under a lease. And if you're hard on it, you might want to. But normally the best motoring is after you've written the thing off, you've depreciated it. If you've looked after it, the, the most cost-effective use of it is in that next three to four year period afterwards, if you look after it. For some people, that's why leasing works well because they just get a new vehicle every time. Yeah, but it's that finance that. rate. What is the finance rate to compare that to your other funding options is the key question. Yeah, good advice. 
And the final one, would you recommend a farm management software for assisting in management decisions on farm? Um, <clears throat> the key to our industry going forward is data collection. So um, I'm an accountant. Um, I understand the financial products deeply. Um, in terms of the other on-farm systems, FarmX, um, there's a percentage of them out there. I don't understand them well enough. That's why we have a team approach. If we start looking at that stuff, we'll bring farm consultants in that deal with that stuff. The key to me is you should be using something because having access to data is going to be the key. And what I'm hoping for in the future is to be able to merge that on-farm data with the financial data and have it one big data pool so we can actually start really analysing and having a much better linkage between the physical and the financial. But we have to have that data to get there. So I, I don't have any preference on the specific products, but get the data, that's the key bit. Thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, for sharing tonight, Fraser, and for giving up your time for our farmers. Uh, key insights for me were um, plan, carry it out and review it. Um, having your team around you and being held to account by your team, which I think is really critical. Uh, measuring your risks and knowing your farm. So knowing what systems suit your farm and keeping it simple. So um, be confident where you are in the cycles and the levers that we can pull as well, I think it's um, really critical. So as a farmer, I think I'll take away tonight, I really liked your idea of the 24 month planning. For us, we're probably looking at a 12 month cycle, but always thinking ahead. But um, yeah, that going a bit further and going that 24 months and, and around managing that overdraft and things like that, I think it's really important. And then, Hannah, and then the challenge from there is I've got people that are going five years. And so those both programs have that ability, not doing cash flows, but just the understanding actually what it looks like for five years. And nice. once you've done the first two years, it's actually not too hard to do it. And then you have that, you can understand, well, in five years, can I buy that next block of land? What cash and what levers do I have to get there? Yeah, nice. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take that as my action tonight. I encourage everyone um, at home there to have one thing that they're going to take away and put into action as well because I think if we try and take 10 things away and put them in practice it makes it really hard yep. but if we just take one really key thing tonight cement that in our heads and try and make that change that's really important so but um there's also that um piece around talking as a farming team's critical um don't be afraid out there to reach out for support um it's really challenging, um, but also uh, we see that as an opportunity as well. So um, to keep looking up and to keep looking forward. Um, I know on farm we've been through some really challenging times. I um, remember a time when I was, oh, I can't remember which child it was, uh, heavily pregnant with one of our children and uh, succession wasn't going that great. Um, and we were in the middle of calving and lambing and the pressure had got too much on farm. So we actually got Rural Support Trust in to help us. So, but for us, it ended up being quite a pivotal moment in our pathway forward now when we look back at that time. So it got us through that day and the next day and the next day after that. And so, you know, I just encourage farmers to never be too proud to pick up the phone and um, talk to some people. Um, and yeah, I can't recommend Rural Support Trust enough. Um, the number's in the chat, 0800 787 254. So yeah, if, um, yeah, if you've got any further questions in the audience, reach out to your extension managers. You've all got my number now in the chat. Um, you, can track, and you, can we're my, you can track my email down off the website and send me a question as well if you've got any questions. More than happy to talk to people. Yeah, thanks, Fraser. Um, I look, We look forward to seeing you all back here next Monday for webinar three, looking forward. So why are we in a recession and how to picture the future is the topic for next week. Our guest is accountant Luke Kemes. He's very entertaining and he'll have you really thinking outside the box. Uh, before you go tonight, please take the time to fill in the poll. We would really appreciate your feedback. Olivia's popped it in the chat and I can see some people already filling it in there. Uh, thanks again for joining the Beef and Lamb team for our series, So Grow and Thrive, a webinar series to empower farmers for financial success. And thanks to Fraser. Good night, everybody.